Welcome everyone. We're really excited to have you here for our Mighty Move Monday. We have Dr. Pam Kastner with us and a surprise guest, Lindsay Kimmini, the author of the book is with us. So always a treat when um, Lindsay can join us. So we're really excited to have her here. Um, in the chat, I put a Google Doc. If you would put, um, think about your favorite line from move two or move three that you want to jot down on that Google Doc, you can. Um, Dr. Kastner is going to uh, share her favorite lines. We're going to sprinkle in some sort of gories and we're going to get going on these moves. I see that we have people from, someone from Canada and Idaho and Ohio. Thank you. More Canada, California. So good to see you all here. Um, Nancy, go ahead. You can forward the screen for us. So tonight we are going to have um, Dr. Kastner's perspective on move two. Move two is very important. Teaching phonics explicitly and systematically. Uh, those words explicit and systematic um, had some weight in Lindsay's book, which I surely appreciated. And move three, teaching decoding strategies, not cueing strategies. It's really important for us as teachers to know the difference between the two. I found that um, in working with teachers, they don't always realize that they're cueing. So I think that's really important. We'll talk about how Sortigories um, supports that and have some question and answer time. So without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. So um, Pam, I already shared the golden oh, line. Okay. Sorry. Right. So feel free to okay, jump right in. Okay. <laughs> scroll through or flip through move two and three and put your favorite line in the chat. I'll repaste it in case you're just coming in. Okay, so this is a structure that I've done with book studies, and I think it's it's really powerful to bring a community into talking about uh, the book. So um, I want to thank Lindsay so much for being here. And as she knows, um, I think I was like 1130 at night when I was texting her when she first sent uh, one of the chapters to me. And I said, uh, I told her then, I think I said, Lindsay, this is going to be like a number one bestseller. <laughs> this is going to be the book that all teachers are talking about. And she was like, are you, you think so? And Lindsay, what did the book hit just last week? <laughs> or was it even before that? It was, yeah, the weekend before it hit number one on Amazon. <laughs> so, in in a couple fun. different categories, right? Not yeah. I mean, hit yeah. in a couple categories, which is really exciting. Yeah. So Nice, congratulations. Just, as a little background, um, I taught kindergarten um, for 18 years. And as I read uh, Lindsay's book, all I kept thinking about was I so wish this book had been in existence when I was a teacher, honestly. Um, I think Lindsay has done an outstanding job of sharing the research in a way that's accurate, but also so approachable for any teacher, like a welcome into the science of reading. But what she does in her book that is so rare and so well done is she tells us how it's applied in classrooms. And um, the videos that we see of her practice and real kids doing it, um, it just, it's just such a powerful, powerful book. And so when I was reading it, much like you, I maybe, yep, I, you can see a little bit because I don't have my, I have my background on here, but mine is like highlighted everywhere. It's tabbed everywhere. And I wanted to share where I've tabbed a few places. I can't sh share all of those with you because <laughs> we only have an hour, but I also wanted to learn from you what resonated with you. And actually, Lindsay, I did this Google doc because I didn't know you were gonna be here. And I had said to Cheryl and Nancy, I think this would be really powerful too for Lindsay to kind of see what's resonating. What I'm sure you're hearing, I know you've been presenting places, but what's resonating with people um, as they read this book? All right, so that's where I'm going to start with my golden lines. And so that's what Cheryl had put into the chat. And um, periodically, Cheryl and, and Nancy, as um, we're accumulating the golden lines from those folks who are attending, maybe we could stop and kind of share what folks are sharing. And then maybe Lindsay would even want to uh, jump in a little bit too. Okay, so we're going to start with move to uh, teach phonics explicitly and systematically. And what stood out to me on the very first page was uh, when Lindsay was talking about um, when she was teaching, uh, why not teach in a way that benefits all children? <laughs> um, certainly when I was teaching, uh, just like Lindsay, I was teaching implicit phonics, but I was not teaching them 
explicitly. I didn't have a scope and sequence that I was relying on. So I'm um, just curious, there's anyone else out there like me when I was teaching long ago where they were teaching in a way that was implicit and not explicit for phonics? So maybe in the chat, if that was you too. Anyone else out there was that just me? <laughs> That, okay, that was Cheryl. Yeah. Yeah, so in this chapter, Lindsay's really focusing on the explicitness. Yes, it was potluck approach, uh, mine too, a bit of this, a bit of that. Um, we're gonna look at a slide here in just a moment, but I've often heard of uh, phonics being sprinkled in, right? And uh, we talk, uh, Emily Hanford talks about it as uh, a phonics patch. So I wanted to share a quote with you too that kind of aligns with what Lindsay was saying, spray and pray. There you go, Cheryl. Yeah, there you go. Uh, where we're kind of putting in a phonics patch in our uh, classroom instruction. So has anyone ever also heard this quote? This is one that resonated with me when I thought of this chapter. Um, studies of reading development, studies of instructional practices, studies of teachers and schools, found to be effective converge on the conclusion that attention to small units and early reading instruction is helpful for all children, harmful for none, and crucial for some. So Cheryl's gonna put that into the, the um, chat there. And then when I looked at this um, golden line from Lindsay, that's exactly the, the research that I thought of as well. Why haven't we been teaching in a way that benefits all kids, teaching directly, explicitly, and systematically? And then, of course, Lindsay does a great job of, of explaining uh, what that means and what a scope and sequence would look like oh, in a logical way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and this brings me back to um, Emily Hanford's uh, comment that oftentimes we're um, patching in phonics. And of all the um, science of reading topics, phonics is the one that gets the most attention, right? Um, there's this concern about drill and kill, drill and kill. Lindsay, is that <laughs> you bring that up in your in your book as well? Yes. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be drill and kill, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And our friend Anita Archer is where you go to next in this chapter, where we talk about uh, what does explicit mean and what does systematic mean. So I wanted to highlight some uh, golden lines from there. So. Um, of course, uh, Dr. Archer, I saw her this summer, actually, and she said this, I do, we do, you do. Um, focus is something she coined all the way back in 1972, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's been around for a long time. So what I really, really love about this part of Move To, um, and I actually have written down here, I love Lindsay's advice for um, how we're implementing the I do, we do, you do. So I'm going to highlight some of my uh, golden lines in this part, right? So oftentimes when I hear I do, we do, you do, um, I think that it can be misconstrued. And I think that's what Lindsay's trying to do in this part of the book as well, is that um, it's an one I do, uh, one we do together, and then off you go. Um, and Lindsay talked about that importance of practice, right? And so she highlights how important it is that the I do, we do, you do, it can be for a single lesson in one day, or it can be spread out over many, many days. Um, and she, I'm looking at, um, in particular, the quote around page 43, where she says, allow yourself to go back and forth between steps within a single lesson. Consider the three closest steps as fluid. Don't be surprised if your lesson ends up more like I do, we do, I do again, we do again, you do, we do again, you do again. So I, I don't know if anyone else <laughs> highlighted this, but for me, that's one thing I highlighted, but also I put, as I said, I love Lindsay's advice here because I think we can get stuck in catchphrases and we can say, I do, we do, you do, but it's in the intentionality of understanding this and using it to inform our instruction and our intervention that really makes a difference. And I really wanted to point out how well you do that, Lindsay Kemeny. Um, next one. Uh, and this is so interesting because IDA will certainly uh, very, very soon be releasing uh, a topic journal article around practice. Um, oftentimes what we're finding out when um, this happened to me, I would go to the next grade level and ask 
um, if they taught something under scope and sequence and the teachers would say they taught it, but my students hadn't learned it. <laughs> uh, has that ever happened to anyone else? <laughs> Right. And so oftentimes what we're finding is even in the I do, we do, you do, uh, as Lindsay really um, securely points out how important guided practice is, that practice piece that we have oftentimes a practice gap. We may be teaching directly and explicitly, but we are not providing enough practice for our students. We know uh, for typically developing readers, if they come to an unknown word, if they do, as Lindsay suggests, the move free, which we'll talk about shortly, they pay attention to the letter sequence and they map graphemes and phonemes and bond it to meaning. And one to four exposures, the word becomes a sight word. They know it effort effortlessly and automatically. Um, but unfortunately, um, not all students in one to four exposures are gonna own a word that they decode. They need many, many, many practice opportunities. And I always say they don't come in with a little sticky note on their forehead saying, I need this many practices <laughs> with this word. And so we have to be very intentional about providing enough guided practice and that we do, we do, we do. And that cycling back to that explicit instruction that um, Lindsay was talking about before we release them on their own or to practice with a peer. So that's another thing I wanted to point out. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, consider those approaches to be fluid. It's an I do, we do, you do. It can be an I do, we do, and back to the I do with explicit instruction. And often lots of we do, we do, we do. Um, and maybe even you all do, right? So um, this is also another um, infographic that I find really, really helpful to um, deepen my understanding about uh, the I do, we do, you do. This comes from Jess Searle. She's a um, national trainer for enhanced core reading instruction. So I wanted to share this with you as well. When we think of tier one, we might look at it as an I do, we do, we do, we do, you do. But you can see over the uh, course of the tiers um, that we have much uh, more explicit instruction, much more guided practice and lots and lots and lots and lots of we do um, for our students. So I wanted to share that as well, but I think that's a really important point in this chapter is the explicitness of the instruction, but the many opportunities for practice, but the fluidity of the I do, we do, you do uh, as we move across those um, practices um, to ensure that our kids are mastering those skills and not that we just have um, offered opportunities for explicit instruction. The practice is critically important. So I think that Lindsay just does an outstanding job with that. The other Thank you. Oh, Can I add in. one little idea? Um, so I, I love this slide and I have seen you share this before. And also Dr. Anita Archer shares a version of this. And it's like, she'll do a whole bunch of we do's. We do, we do, we do. And some of them are in capitals. And then some were like lowercase. And what she meant by that was the amount of scaffolding that goes into that. We can have a we do where we have a lot of scaffolding. Like this can be like verbal prompts for from us or even visual. And then we can gradually pull back on those and give less scaffolding. And I thought that was kind of a neat way to think about it too. Oh yeah, I would love to see that one as well. That's what I think, that's what I think too. And that's what you do. I'm gonna talk about that uh, in move three, Lindsay, that you do in terms of scaffolding. That um, one of my favorite sayings that I don't know who said it or I would give them credit, but it's the ones doing the work or the ones doing the learning, mm -hmm. right? And so um, we want to ensure that our kids are doing the work, but we're providing the scaffold that they need, but we're gradually releasing that responsibility so that they can become independent. And the formative um, assessment that we do along the way in the I do, we do, and even in the you do, as we're, uh, as Dr. Archer would say, we'll walk around, look around, talk around, so that we know whether we need to go back to the I do, for more intentional instruction and for whom we have to do that with. So for me in this in this chapter, these are really critical points and, and important nuances and details when we think about um, explicit the explicitness part of explicit instruction. So I I really love how you um, really brought that out um, for a teacher for me. It would have been really, really helpful to me when I was teaching 
to understand the nuances of, of this and the intentionality of the ID reading you do. So thank you for that. And then of course the other um, big idea among uh, explicit instruction is the systematic part of that, that um, we are moving from least complex to most complex and we're building upon what we have taught before. And what I love that Lindsay has done in this book too is if you'll turn to page uh, 44, um, it's always important to have examples, but what Lindsay uh, rightly does as well is she provides non-examples. So what, uh, what does explicit and systematic look like? Um, and what doesn't it look like? So I, I have really appreciated that because I know um, when I was learning about the science of reading and explicit instruction, I needed guideposts along the way. I needed explicitly what should it look like and what should I stop doing? And again, um, of course, at the end of each chapter, you did a great job of what we should start doing and what we should stop doing. But I um, appreciated um, that table to provide explicitness to me and to other um, others as well. I think it was very, very important. But also, <laughs> um, I appreciated the scope and sequences that you provided. Because as you noted, there is not one universal um, scope and sequence for phonics instruction. Um, but when we look at those that are based on the evidence and are based on research, we find that they begin with the most frequent, most common, um, and move to the least frequent. And they begin with the least complex and they move to the most complex. <clears throat> and I think it's important for, um, as Dr. Uh, Motes would say, um, teachers teach kids, not programs. So as we move towards the science of reading, uh, we will be offered instructional materials and we have to be really informed consumers. And um, you have two really good examples here of what a um, evidence-based scope and sequence should look like, but that general rule of least complex to most complex, but also what I really appreciated that you pointed out was, and that was on, I have this highlighted to you, although it's not a golden line, sorry, on um, page 47, is that the skills build on one another, mm -hmm. that they're not separate entities, that there is a logic to the instruction and a system to the instruction, and that the instruction builds on one another, that they're not isolated lessons. So those were key points. What I love about your book, Lindsay, is you um, introduce us to the research in a way that's approachable um, and applies to the classroom. Then you provide instructional routines that can guide us towards that. And then you offer different ways we can implement that in our classroom with examples from your um, instruction as well. So I thought this was a good point when I talked to Cheryl and Nancy that now we have an understanding of um, phonics instruction where we're connecting, uh, since our move one was phonemic awareness, we're mapping phonemes to graphemes. Um, phonemic awareness is absolutely essential in an alphabetic language, a morphophonemic language like ours. But if we're not mapping phonemes to graphemes, but you talk about how you're marrying sound spelling laws or we're mapping those letters to sounds, um, we're not going to be moving students towards decoding, and you rightfully point out how important encoding is and dictation. Um, and if students can spell a word, um, they can read a word, but not vice versa. That we require complete and accurate representations of a word when we're spelling. Um, and so, when I always, uh, when I'm teaching spelling, I always make my <laughs> my audience say, or my participants say. When I'm teaching spelling, I am teaching reading. You are getting double uh, bang for your buck. Um, and so that is another point that you are really explicit about um, in this chapter. So not only in this chapter, um, did you teach us about explicitness and systematic, but you also showed us what that looked like. Um, and I said to Cheryl and Nancy, I think this is a good spot where they could also point out in sort of stories in relation to the instructional routine, uh, the phonics lesson um, that aligns with that explicitness. So I'm going to turn that over to them and then we're going to go back to um, strategies for move two. Okay. Should we um, see what the other yeah. golden lines are yeah, well, first? Yes, yeah, so that would be awesome. Okay, so let me let me just hit a couple of them here. Um, specifically for move two, we have um, 
I'll put them in the order that they are in the on the sheet. So on page 65, students use a secret password to enter the room, such as shh. I love that one. Yeah. That's that's a great one. Um, page 42. Don't be surprised if your lesson ends. Oh, you talked about this one, Pam. You, you already hit this one. More like I do, we do, I do it again. I chuckled when I read that one too. I agree with that one. Um, page 47. Oh gosh, I feel like I can hear Anita saying this one. We have no reported incidents of children dying of practice. Um, she said she just attended a reading league webinar with Anita where she reminded that I can hear her voice. And if you that have heard Dr. Archer speak yeah. can probably hear her voice on that one as well. So, so thank you for that. And the secret password, Lindsay, is there anything extra you want to share about that secret password when they enter the room? Uh, no, I just, I make them touch the, um, the post-it note. So even if they're, even if they don't know it and they're just repeating what they just heard the person in front of them say, they're, they're at least their eyes are going there and looking at it as they say it. So it's just another practice opportunity. Quick, quick one. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for writing your um, golden lines. We'll give you some time to do the same for move three. And Nancy is going to um, hit some high points, some connections with sortigories, then we'll go to move three. Okay, let me do that. Well, I didn't know that Pam was going to approach this as golden lines, but these quotes that I have are are probably some that stood out to, to me. Whoops. Um, and my this PowerPoint still has this little fancy thing going forward. Um, but I think the big takeaway is we need to teach students how to connect the sounds they hear to the print that they see. And that is the, uh, the heart of what we're trying to do. <clears throat> and a little later, 10 pages later, um, we talk about that in terms of the alphabetic principle. And I think both of those really stood out to me because I think that's what we don't want to lose sight of as we're working on this. And that is really part of what's at the heart of sortigories. And a, this other quote um, from, that you had in the book about a truly systematic approach to phonics means teaching all of the major letter sound correspondences, not just your favorites um, or the ones that you happen to go in the alphabetic order. Um, sorry. Um, and that is why we have um, definitely in Sortigories um, built the program or the, the activities based on the scope and sequence. So for example, and, and this partially reinforces what Pam was saying, is that we work first uh, in level A on getting some of the short vowels established because those are the most common. They're going to give us the most bang for the buck in terms of that, parts of words and little words that we can read. Um, we also are separating word, uh, sounds that um, are the same, like the k for C is not introduced in the same lesson as the k for uh, the k spelled with K. But we do explain that there's a positional factor going on with CK. And I'll show, we'll talk more about that in a moment. And then in our level B scope and sequence, um, we continue on with the importance of the vowels and rolling those out in a very systematic way. And we'll show in a minute um, how those, um, the position of the vowel within a syllable or a word is what's going to be uh, significant. So um, we just really applaud all your emphasis on um, the scope and sequence, Lindsay, and we couldn't agree with you more. Um, again, in sortigories, um, those activities that are most squarely focused on teaching this sound to spelling or uh, phoneme to graphing correspondences is what we do in row number one. Um, and then I really loved um, Lindsay's lesson uh, plan and thinking about where might sortigories be uh, most effective. Whoops, as I said, this is going ahead on its own. Um, for sure, we think sortigories might help in certain cases, review a, a particular um, component that the students need to practice. We also think you could use um, those row one activities, particularly sound match or map it to give a phonemic awareness warm up, um, and it's very structured for you. Um, there are 
all of the activities uh, as we move in to build it in row one and the subsequent two rows, we are, kids are reading the words that they can uh, build um, based on the, the phonics that they have learned, those sound to spelling, cor sound to spelling correspondences. And last but not least, we really do think we are about providing extended practice that after we've, I've done it, you've done it, <laughs> and uh, we've, I've done it, we've done it, and you're doing it, you can keep doing it um, using uh, sortigories uh, independently. And for those students who need that many trials, we hope that it can be a useful, uh, useful tool. Cheryl or, or Pam, anything you'd want to add before we move back to uh, the golden lines? No, I guess I would just ask before we move to um, move to move to is are there any questions about anything so far? Uh, we have the unique privilege of having Lindsay in the house and Dr. Pam Kastner. So if there's any questions, you could put them in the chat or unmike yourself and just let us know what your questions might be before we go to move to. If we can stay here just for a minute, I, I'd ask everyone as you look at this lesson plan to look at the number of opportunities and the structure that provides practice. So I would like to look at the um, the weight of the lesson, right? So we have a review which provides interleave practice for um, concepts that have been learned before that we want to bring back. So we have both dis distributed and cumulative practice. We state the goal of the lesson, but then we see we have a phonemic awareness warm up. We're getting our uh, mouths ready, those articulatory gestures that we're going to map our um, phonemes to our graphemes. Again, that's practice from sounds that have been taught previously. Um, we introduce a new concept, but then immediately after we've done that, I do that direct instruction, you see practice. We see that we're uh, practicing the concept, uh, reading the words that we had just learned. And then we move from uh, letter sound correspondences from decoding right to encoding. Um, which I, I'm a huge fan of dictation and oftentimes in a lesson plan, what I see is sometimes I see dictation at the end. What I liked about this is I see dictation right after we read words, we spell words, because sometimes we get busy as teachers and I oftentimes will see dictation gets um, pushed to the side. And it's, it's so very important to spell what we read and read what we spell. Um, and then we moved into connected text. So the skills that we've learned in isolation, we are practicing in connected text, and then we're providing extended practice. Um, so I, I just wanted to point out when I look at this lesson plan, I see lots and lots and lots of practice, um, intentional, explicit teaching, but lots of practice so that students can master these skills. And while they're practicing, um, I am monitoring their learning. So I know in the cycle of the I do, we do, you do, what I have to go back to, whether that might be whole group. If I'm seeing that across my whole classroom, it's telling me that I need to reteach in a way that's for the whole group. So to be most effective and efficient with my time or whether I need to pull small groups. So Lindsay, I don't know if you want to, this is your lesson plan, if you want to share anything, but that's what stands out to me in a, in a very um, effective lesson plan, that explicit instruction, but many opportunities for practice. And one thing I would add is, and I don't even think I put this in the book, but think about the transitions between these different things and think about in your classroom, the physical location where you and your students are going to be and do they need to move partway through? Like I have those first four steps. We are at the carpet, like at the rug, and I'm right there. I just feel like they all could kind of focus a little better, and we have our sound spelling wall there. And um, if you need to use mirrors for that part, think about how you could quickly pass those out. Like I have a little way that they take one and, and pass it, and it's really quick. So think about that, and then we go to our desk. So between four and five, I've introduced a new concept, talked about it a little bit at my whiteboard, and then I say, desk, 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 and they go, desk, 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 and that's their cue to stand up and they go to the desk and I play a little alphabet song. We're first grade, so we're doing, we're still reviewing um, the alphabet. And by the time that song is done, they need to be at their at desk, have their whiteboards out and, the, and their markers and their erasers. So it's like little things like this that sometimes you don't think about, but those little transitions 
to get them really tight and smooth. And that's like today I was telling you guys, I had just the best teaching day. It was like, oh, they, they got it. They got there so quick. Then they sang the song. We turned it off. We read some words together. They were ready for dictation. They were right with me. And our, our lesson just went so much quicker because we had the little transitions all down. So anyway, just something to think about is like where you are, where the students are, what they need, those kinds of things. That's wow. And you've, you've just okay. described the power of the routine that it just maximizes the, the teaching time, the practice time. You're just, you know, every minute is counting. It's just fantastic, really. Yeah. It made me think, Lindsay, maybe you have another mini book or <laughs> some uh, kind of the sequel. <laughs> well, because um, when we think of MTSS, we oftentimes only think of the academic. I, and I'm not saying there's anything you know wrong with thinking about the academic part of MTSS, but uh, we forget about the behavior um, and how integral that is to effective instruction. And so um, those transitions, um, I just remember when I was teaching kindergarten, my husband would say to me, like, what did you teach this week? And I would, it basically would be all of those things that you just talked about. And he'd say, don't they know how to do, don't they know how to line up? Don't they know how to sit in the learning position? I was like, no. no. <laughs> kindergarten, nothing. You know, ground zero. Yes. yes. And Anita would say a suicide, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you that, Lindsay, that. Thank you for bringing that up because it's so essential to have those routines down, both instructional and behavioral, so that we can benefit from these types of routines that provide the effective practice that we need. Yeah, so thanks so much for that. Yeah, uh, and like, it, is, it plays into behavior, you know, and and they're so proud. Like you might think, oh, this this is boring or something. It's not to them. They have a structure that they know. Then their cognitive energy can go towards the new concept that you're doing. And they're just so proud. They get out their things. They have it and they're up there and they're just like so happy and confident. And it's great. Because they, they know what to expect. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing as you said with the instructional routine. That's why instructional routines are so powerful. The students do not need to be focusing on what is the teacher want, asking me to do. They know so they can focus on the content and the cognitive part, right? As you said, the cognitive load. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. Like yeah. our friend Anita Archer says, too, uh, in all this practice, like we have no reported incidents of children dying of practice. And so if you want to see her saying that on a video, she um, does an incredible, and I'll send it to Cheryl and Nancy. Many people probably are, know it because it is just fabulous. But she did it for Middle Tennessee State University, the Center for Dyslexia, an expert minute on explicit instruction. And she says that we have no reported instances of kids dying from practice. And she says, drill and skill and drill and thrill, right? There's no one like our friend Anita Archer, but um, just, a, just a wonderful resource. Okay, so um, as in every chapter, what I love about this book, which I think sets it apart from every other book that's out there, is that now that we've talked about the science and the research in a way that's accurate and approachable, now what does that look like in a real classroom? How is that translated? And that's, for me as a teacher, that was the part that I was always craving. I was appreciative of learning about uh, research and basing my instruction on evidence, but now tell me how. Um, help me translate that. What do I do tomorrow? And that's really what Lindsay does and uh, so expertly. What I like about so many of Lindsay's um, practices is they are what I call low prep, high outcome. Um, I almost want to make it into an acronym. acronym. I was going to do high outcome, low prep, and be HALP. But I thought, oh, that's not very... <laughs> <laughs> that is not very catchy. So I think I'll just keep it as low prep, high outcome, right? So these were um, in this chapter, these low prep, high outcomes so that I really resonated with me. So um, I'm just going to point them out. I'm sure maybe they resonated with you as a uh, uh, low prep, high outcome. Now there's other ones, but these are the ones I wanted to kind of just surface for you. Always partner work. But then back to Lindsay's, um, you know, advice to us to ensure that we're teaching routines. We upfront and teach routines of how to do partner work so that we can multiply the teachers in our classroom, right? And um, we can take the words that we were working on or the concept that we were working on, partner one, 
is the, the example first, to provide a model, then partner two, and we just keep going until Lindsay says stop. Um, that is not a time consuming preparation for the teacher. It's a low prep, high outcome, and you're multiplying the uh, teachers in the classroom. And as students are working in partners, we're back to our Anita Archer friend, walk around, look around, talk around, so that I am formatively assessing where kids are. So partner work for me, um, it's always going to be one of those low prep, high outcome opportunities for me uh, to inform my instruction. I loved the eraser game. I, I, I was like, oh my gosh, if I, I when I was teaching um, Houston, if I'd had the eraser game, um, I love the eraser game. So I hope that others um, love that as well. Um, Lindsay, I don't know if you want to share anything about the eraser game or the vow intensive because they, they um, have some similars, but. Um, Anything you want to share? Who, how did you, was that, I'm trying to remember because I know some came from EBLI, but was I, eraser... yeah, I learned both of those from a different, like the eraser game. Um, I learned from the reading horizons program, the Val intensive. I learned from the Institute of multisensory education. Yeah, I love that so, one. um, yeah, the eraser game is so easy and you can just, just another way to review. You can give a clue about the meaning of the word or about something phonics related, which word has the sound ah, and then they have to point to the word and then they read the word. There's another opportunity to read the word and then they erase that word. And then, you know, these are, if you haven't read this chapter yet, it's after you do dictation. So on their whiteboard, they have all the words that they wrote and then you do the eraser game, just kind of a fun way to practice and erase. <laughs> right, and I love how the eraser game also marries uh, the two parts of the simple view of reading, right? We're yeah. looking at the words and we're paying attention to the print but we're also talking about meaning. So whenever we can marry both, it's so critically important. We want our students to not only decode words, but we need to build their language at this, you know, simultaneously. And the eraser game does that in such an easy way. I love the uh, Val intensive game because it's so adaptable. And anytime, um, one of my uh, things that uh, I worked very hard as a teacher to stop doing, which was hard because we see it modeled so many times, and we've done it likely many times, is uh, raising hands. Um, uh, I say this too when I'm training. If I have uh, 40 people in a presentation training and I want to check for understanding and I ask a question and people raise their hand, um, my ratio, I'm not a math person, I'm a literacy person, but my ratio is 1 to 40, which is 2.5% of my evidence base. I'm basing my next instructional move on 2.5%, <laughs> right? Because I'm only hearing from one person out of the 40. So always uh, with whiteboards, uh, which you mentioned as well too, we want to have all student responses. And so the um, Val intensive is another great way to do with those little tents, but we can adapt it, sound level, syllable, word level, Again, like a low prep, high outcome because it's so versatile how you can use it. But at the same time, all students are responding and I am finding out as a teacher what my students know and it's informing my next instructional move. Um, we've talked about a secret password. I love that. And as Lindsay said, uh, pointed out very uh, specifically, we want kids looking at the, the whatever the prompt is, the letter, the word, and we want them saying that. That's because we know with orthographic mapping, even by seeing the word and saying the word, we are in the process of orthographic mapping. We are. We need to be paying attention to the letter sequence, mapping graphemes to phonemes and bonding it with meaning. And this is another practice opportunity. And you wouldn't think, oh, just kind of touching something as you walk into the room, looking at it and saying it is supporting orthographic mapping, but it is. Right, so nice little secret password there. And as you know, um, my middle name right now is Pam Spelling Kastner. So um, show what you know is um, was really, really powerful to me. Um, and that movement from you know the spelling test that so many of us, at least for me, because I'm old with six grandkids, uh, you know, learn those words, uh, memorize them during the week, and then take the test on Friday and forget the words on Saturday, right? So we're showing what you know, and we're um, testing with novel words that follow the pattern, right? So it shifts from a test to like show what you know, right? And by showing uh, what you know, um, then I know what I need to do as a teacher. So um, 
this is one of the, I think the meatiest chapters in the book, Lindsay. And I think that was purposeful and important because phonics is, um, I know sometimes science of reading people are being accused of being fombies and phonicators, um, but um, it's because the attention has been on phonics because um, it's been more of an implicit instruction for many decades. Um, and as teachers, I'll speak for myself, I wasn't taught um, in higher ed how to um, teach explicitly. And so there has been a focus here because it's been um, an area that has not had as much attention in the past. But as um, educators, um, and Lindsay too, as you know from seven mighty moves, she didn't do you know, two mighty moves, <laughs> phonics and phonemic awareness, right? Um, she did seven mighty moves. We're always, um, as you saw in her lesson plan too, we're integrating both language uh, comprehension and word recognition always um, we want um, skilled readers that can decode words acting automatically but also know what they they mean but um, one of the things I value is the low prep high outcome so thank you for that Lindsay all right all right so uh, we'll move on to uh, move three and it's teach decoding strategies not cueing strategies <laughs> and my golden line right from the very beginning um, was they looked like they were reading, they sounded like they were reading, but they weren't. Um, and I think that probably many of you um, felt the same way when you learned about the science of reading. That's how I felt. Um, I remember kids reading, I, I like cats, I like dogs. I, I can still remember one of my grandkids uh, getting to the pages, I Like Dolphins, uh, a kindergarten book. And immediately what I saw um, was um, her eyes go right to the picture. And I said, oh, have we learned multisyllabic words at pH? Is... <laughs> no, we haven't. So, yep, <laughs> those books were no longer <laughs> um, um, in, my kids in my kids' house um, because it, it makes uh, teachers think that kids are reading. It can look like they're reading. And before I knew better, I was checking off little running records and check, 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 check. They are reading these words. Um, but if I were to um, pull out dolphins or a, a similar word independently, they can't read them. They're using these habits. And you um, rightly point out how this wires the brain and it causes habits for students to look away from the word instead of at the word um, to decode it and how very difficult anyone who is um, a tutor who might be on here or who has worked with kids who are struggling know how very 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 difficult it is to break these habits once they are established so this is a very important chapter about stopping um, if we are engaging in these three queuing strategies, these um, beanie baby strategies that we see um, often and we've been taught and moving to prompting that ensures um, students are keeping their eyes on the print, mapping uh, graphemes to phonemes and bonding to um, meaning so that the words are not only decoded, we certainly want them to decode those words, but we also want them to remember them and store them in memory. And that's the orthographic mapping process. So um, that's what stood out to me, <laughs> to me too. And you pointed out um, Dr. Airy's work, of course, um, her seminal research on orthographic mapping and how these um, strategies do not align with that. So I don't know if you want to add anything there, Lindsay, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say it's so much easier to use these strategies. Like as a teacher, it's so much easier to be like, here's your repetitive text, memorize the pattern. And then you just listen to them. And it's like the reading, <laughs> this is great. And it's harder and it takes more patience to listen to them as they decode every word, you know, they sound out the word Sam, and then it's on the next page and they sound it out again. <laughs> it's on the next page and they sound it out again, but that's exactly what needs to happen. And we need that, you know, productive struggle. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, yeah. it's all coated um, at that phase, um, glued to the print. But for me, when kids are glued to the print, um, that's a good sign in a phase. It shows me that they are glued to the print. They are paying attention to the letter sequences, the graphemes, and they're mapping into phonemes. And we're talking about the meaning. So it's a phase um, along the process to become automatic. And without it, um, we don't become automatic or we look like we're reading and then we hit third or fourth grade. And then all of a sudden we say, what happened? It's because we weren't really reading in the first place. So one yeah. quote that you quote <laughs> in this in this move is um, the best cue from Mark Seidenberg. The best cue to a word is the word itself, right? And I think that was I, I love that quote from Mark Seidenberg. Um, I posted that in the in the past, and I I really like your analogy too. I think you do a good job, and you have always in your blogs of telling stories that um, align with um, the science of reading, but to help us connect and the story about swimming and walking and looking like they're swimming, but they're not really, they are walking. Um, I think that was a, a great analogy. Um, all right, so um, <laughs> there were lots of, <laughs> there were lots of, uh, strategies here and what I wanted to point out and you can elaborate here Olympi, is um, in what I see in these sequences of um, supporting students and paying attention to the word and mapping graphing to phonemes and bonding is that we are um, providing initially um, that the ones doing the work are the ones doing the cell so we I, you say a lot of times you like take your pencil and you point you're not even saying anything. And that's the thing I think is so critically important to know about this move is uh, teacher talk to a minimum. And when we do need to speak, very concise. So we begin just by pointing and that's just a pointing cue that means like pay attention here, right? And so you're moving in these strategies, which I really appreciated in this chapter is that you're moving from least supported to more and more supported as students need that. But the thing is, I think that requires, I, I think, um, expertise in knowing our students and knowing for which student I just point. And for uh, one, I might point and say uh, sound. So I don't know if you want to bring, but I think that I know in your book, you've been very intentional about everything. So I, I guess I want to surface since you were lucky enough to have you here in this sequence. Um, tell us about why you chose a sequence and how you use these sequences of support in decoding as you're teaching. Okay. Um, and the, the first thing with the cueing is it's like moves one and move two those need to be strong and being taught those explicit phonemic awareness and phonics in order to be able to use decoding strategies and not three cueing strategies right and then that um the decoding prompts when you're talking about first i just point and i i you do kind of get to know your students but i usually that's my first thing is like when i hear them read and they missed a word I just point to it first to see, give them a chance to see if they can just fix that. And I'm usually like pointing to the little part they missed. Now I will know if it's like, uh, you know, we're, I haven't taught this phonics concept and they've got a, you know, it's a high frequency word in there. That's a little more difficult Then I might go ahead and be like, the AI is going to spell eh, say eh, and then have them blend the word said if I hadn't taught that word or something. Um, so just giving them a chance. And then if they don't know the sound, tell them the sound and then have them blend it so that they get that practice of matching the sound with the spelling. Yeah. And so, and, and then some of these others are really like when they're guessing and they have that habit. And, you know, even if they don't have the habit, even if they haven't been taught it, they kind of do that naturally. Like they just want to, as soon as they come to a word that they're like, that looks a little hard. I'm going to look over at the picture. Or they look, <laughs> you know? always look at me, look at me, look at me like, oh, yeah, the yeah. on my forehead. Uh -huh. <laughs> they look up at you and wait. 
And one of the first things, like, especially with, um, cause we're just, you know, our fourth week of first grade. And one of the first habits I'm instilling in them is to point at the words as the reading. And I have them all because even some of them will just, you'll quickly see that they just kind of remembered that sentence and they point to the first word and then they just kind of say it and their eyes went off the page and they might've missed a small one. And I'm like, oh, your finger has to match what's coming out of your mouth. So you, your finger needs to be on each word. <laughs> I like how you, uh, in the book too, how you talk about get your, your, your mouth ready for that, like for that sound or for that focus skill. So, and then the other, the last four really are about um, paying attention to the internal sequences of words and breaking long words into syllables. It's taking those uh, big words that can feel overwhelming to kids and scary. Uh, chunking it up like we uh, do and then blending those parts together, but paying attention to the internal structure. But I really do uh, appreciate how you brought out um, David Kilpatrick's The Lookalike Words. So important because it requires kids to pay attention to the internal structure of the word, especially when you can put them into a chart or an array. And so, and you're listening and you're getting them in the habit of paying attention to all the way through. Too many of our kids look at the first letter or and then guess, uh, especially our kids who may have strong language, who can be our, as Dr. Kilpatrick talked about, our compensators, right? Because they can uh, ride on their language skills, at least for a little while. So thank you for including that, because I think that's a very important strategy to include in our instructional um, tool belt. Um, and then, of course, um, oral decoding. So um, I really appreciated the many entry points to moving away from cueing um, to as alternatives to those Beanie Baby strategies. But I also appreciated the intentionality of the work being done by the student and the expertise by the teacher to um, engage in these strategies. But you gave them lots of different entry points based on the students they have in their classroom. And of course, um, I told you when I first looked at the book, I love the keep, stop, start. Because I think too many times as teachers, we're told to start a lot and we're never told to stop anything. <laughs> so um, I um, really appreciated that. So um, I don't know if there's a, a moment just to look at other, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I took up too much time. I'm so Not sorry. at all. Any no, problem? we want to hear you. Oh, no, no. no, I apologize. No, go, go, go. So, no, no. I just wanted to know what if you had a next slide. No, you no, can't. I don't. I don't have anything. I didn't know if there were any moves we got, uh, golden lines, but we can hold that off to the end. So thank you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Well, very, yes, this is very quick anyway. Um, one of the things that I we talk about in uh, Sortigories is where we hear the sound. So if I say, where did I hear the, uh, the well, I'm going to back up here. Where did I hear the k in cab? If I indicate that in the first space, that's very different than where do I hear the k in back? And that has an implication for how we're going to spell it. So one of the things that's part of the systematic approach that we are laying out in sortigories is paying attention to that. And one of the helps that we provide, and I'll just show this one and very quickly, is um, select a tile for help. So we want to, we've grouped together a pattern that is based on a similar idea of where we hear the sound and how we're going to spell it. So two letters, C, K, spell one sound, K, at the end of a one syllable word with a short vowel. For example, back and sick. So we are giving an example, and then if we did any of the other tiles, it's the same principle. And we think it's very important that we group these so that students do get familiar with, with the concept and have a lot of practice with that. Um, and then um, I loved Lindsay's um, emphasis on using the wipe-off boards because um, we have, well, Sortigories is a web-based product and it's meant to be done um, interactively on a tablet or computer or whatever. There's nothing to keep, um, keep us from having everybody in the group have a wipe-off board. 
We have the screen displayed, and as a word comes up, um, everybody can put it in on their whiteboard in the column in the right category um, and have that encoding practice before um, we do it. Perhaps one student goes to the whiteboard and actually does the answer. And again, I'm not going to show the whole activity, but the idea is we can turn many of the activities into in sortigories into encoding tasks by just add paper or just add um, a whiteboard. And then the other thing that warmed my heart was one of the the golden lines for me was attend a word meaning when the opportunity lends it um, because we are, uh, you know, Cheryl and I came to Sortigories um, on with kids who struggle in mind and but often um, we have kids who have English as their uh, second language or kids who come from more impoverished backgrounds. And they may not, despite the fact that they may be able to read these little words by the end of module one, they may not know what a cab is. And therefore, unless we give them the opportunity to learn that um, and know that, they're going to keep stumbling uh, when they get to that. And so we have in Sortigories, and I think we've shown this before. Um, First, an important question. Really quickly to go there. Um, Is that now it's have, your turn. We Put have each a word in the correct. Where we can select a word to student, see and hear the definition. Or they do the activity, or as a, a correction with the activity, is to literally go through Abs, the stomach words muscles. and learn what the meanings are. They can practice the Bat, decoding. A mammal and then that flies to, mostly at night. The meaning. So category. I wanted to be sure to pick up on that point, which um, as uh, Pam has said several times, brings not only uh, the bottom part of the rope, but the top part of the rope into the picture um, all along. Um, so I think that um, in terms of sortigories, while we keep talking about these, the we're still talking in the first moves about the top part of this network. Um, it's all basically in the service of doing all of these. And, and I don't think um, that any of us in, in this moment are suggesting that we should stay here um, exclusively. We need to be always uh, interleaving um, and interweaving all the layers of, of language at the same time as we are developing the code proficiency. So with that, um, I think this is just repeating what we're saying, whether um, it's from Mighty Moves or from Sortigories, we're saying we're, we're dealing with the whole rope all the time, um, despite the fact that we have to be sure we're getting that basic phonics down uh, accurately and automatically. And that brings us to the end, but it gives us a few more minutes to go back to some things that um, Pam was saying, and, and Lindsay, chime in, please. Well, we have one more move. Um, I mean, one more um, line here from page 73. Uh, one of the most common behaviors of struggling readers, and Pam actually mentioned this, is neglecting to keep their eyes on the words. They look at us for approval or help as if, you know, the word is on our forehead. So we mentioned that, but I just wanted you to know that was echoed by uh, one of the participants. There was also a question a while back in the chat having to do with, no, we missed one. Oh, Holly Lane, I don't, I don't know the exact question, but basically what are your opinions on UFLY and Holly Lane's UFLY? Oh, oh, oh my gosh, I, can I do fireworks and uh, jump up and down? And <laughs> You can. I would echo your fireworks and I, the jumping up I, and down. I think we saw Lindsay answered in the chat, too. I mean, we are, uh, I am, I'm, and I know Lindsay is, too, and I believe Nancy and Cheryl, very huge fans of UFLY. Very, very strong uh, curriculum um, for the lower ends of the rope. And um, what's unique, I think, about um, uh, UFLY, and I think Lindsay would agree, is the interleave practice. The amount of practice, um, it is very direct, very explicit, very systematic, embedding um, um, everything that you're seeing in Lindsay's book, but I, the interleave practice is, is just um, what I think mm -hmm. makes it stand out among um, uh, curricula. And 
the generosity of Holly Lane and Valentine Contess and the team at UFLY. Um, I actually sent Holly <laughs> when I heard about the Maserati that another person has. Um, I sent her a little toy Maserati because I think she really deserves <laughs> she deserves a real one. I can only afford a, a a toy one, but they have offered this. They are making no um, you know no money on that curriculum too. So that that's just unbelievably. Um, generous, and we all know um, with the pandemic, what um, UFLY offered to the field. Um, Holly Lane, Valentine Contest, and um, UFLY, I mean, um, what a gift they are to the entire field. That's my opinion, but you guys can jump in. I, I can't agree more. One of the things that uh, we sat with Holly, and she was talking to us about the, uh, the educative nature of UFLY, that Teaching you fly, whether you're a new teacher coming out of college or a seasoned teacher, perhaps learning or relearning maybe the science of reading, you fly will help you become that better teacher because of the routines, because she's pared down the teacher talk to just the minimum, right? And then when she was reviewing um, sort of gories, you know, she put us in that educative uh, category as well, which was such a compliment. Like there are some products out there that if you can appreciate what's inside of them, they can make us better teachers. Um, so um, also as a compliment from UFLY, they have added sortigories to their decodable text um, tools where the alignment, if you go on in their toolbox, you will see an alignment to, from UFLY to a different decodable text companies. And she's added sortigories in there because um, the, they can, you can start using um, sortigories almost right away. And level B, as we finish at the sentence fluency, we'll have nonfiction decodable text, which UFLY hasn't even seen yet. And they're going to be so excited when they see that. <laughs> and Lindsay's going to be very excited when she sees that because it's the marriage of decodable text and um, paragraph shrinking because that whole yes. idea of who or what is this about is what is the theme through the whole thing, which builds on the syntax that we've been doing through sortigories as well. So um, I can't wait for Lindsay to see that. Yeah. yeah. So that's a great segue to our future moves. You go. We'll be sharing one of that in, in our future moves. What were you going to say, Lindsay? No, I was just, that's, that's awesome. I'm excited to see it. Yeah. yeah it, it's going to be really, it's going to be really fun. So um, moves four and five are coming up on the 18th with Jill Lauren um, with Whole Phonics talking more about decodable text, sight words, heart words, and phrase building. And then on the 25th, we have moves six and seven with fluency and comprehension, um, more on sortigories of vocabulary and syntax. And that will be Dr. Dale Webster from Core Learning. So I'm really excited to have Jill uh, join us. And then the following week, Dale, um, to learn more about uh, Lindsay's mood. So, so exciting. Um, this screen you've seen before, just a reminder of how to get um, Mighty Moves. Now it's also, we can update this slide for the next time now that I'm thinking about it, but it's also available through the Reading League. So it was really nice. Yes. The Reading League yes. bookstore picked up um, the, the Seven Mighty Moves as well. Um, and there's a, a couple QR codes for sortigories on there as well. And, and, and I want to make two, two commercial messages before we, we move off. Number one, Pam mentioned that um, all of us actually are going to be at IDA as part of the uh, Regina Gooden um, Structured Literacy Symposium because um, that symposium is being based on the next issue coming out in the next two weeks of Perspectives, which is all about practice, why the, the part of teaching and learning that's practice is so important. Um, so we're all part of that. And we're very excited to, uh, if you're going to be at IDA, please join us. Um, and then second of all, if you happen to live in the Connecticut tri-state area. Lindsay Kemeny is coming to Connecticut on September 30th uh, to do um, a uh, talk about the book. And we're going to have a Connecticut panel um, there as well to people from the state who are trying to make these mighty moves. And we're going to hear how that's going. So seriously, if you're in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, or Connecticut, come on over to the 
Barack Obama Magnet School, um, University School, um, and join us in, it's the 30th, uh, September 30th. So I want to be sure to mention yeah. those. That's great. So there's one more. I feel like we were just the warm-up band for um, Pam Kastner's um, <laughs> book club coming up because oh, yes. we'll, we'll put that in the show notes. But Pam, your book club, <laughs> yeah. about it I don't have that memorized. I'm sorry, but I do um, warm up. The Same. Reading League Pennsylvania and the Reading League New York have joined forces to offer um, a Seven Mighty Moves book study. Um, it launches October 18th with the one and only Lindsay Kemeny, and it'll just be once a month, and we'll focus on a move. Um, and so we're really excited. The more we can um, promote Lindsay's book and the uh, teaching in it and the practices, the better. So uh, let's keep those book studies coming. <laughs> That's I Thank think you. that too. So we will put that. Um, October date in the in the show notes from this one forward and then other people will have it as well because you know in more conversation you think about different moves in different ways and I think that will be really great our contact information is on the screen I want to thank you everyone for hanging in there and um, we thank you for being here Lindsay it's such a pleasure to have you on screen with us and keep doing the good work girl thank you Cheryl thank, thank you thank you Nancy. Thank you, Pam. Thank you uh -huh. so much. Well, bye. Bye. bye.